Th thanks a lot, Professor, uh, and thank you very much for all of you to come over. I'm really impressed by all the interest, enthusiasm, and particularly Sue's talk, which I uh, enjoyed a lot. <coughs> so, uh, uh, the patients with XLH get uh, treated by clever doctors, and then we kind of stay in the background to, to, to help, really, because we would not be treating the condition, we will just be managing, in a way, the complications which come in a number of shapes and forms, uh, as, as Sue and other speakers have alluded to. Uh, and they're not always the most comfortable uh, uh, treatments, uh, uh, so to say. Uh, I just put it on for the sake of completion, uh, aside from the uh, uh, XLH website, and, and my uh, previous uh, learned colleagues have talked a lot about the genetics. I have nothing more to add, really. Uh, uh, and, and the problem with the fibroblast growth factor is that it, it's not really unique to XLH. Any other condition as well, where there's an overproduction of FTF23, we have problems with the bone um, strength, bone mineralization, um, and, and hence the problems which are caused by that. And whenever there is a bone remodeling, be it in, um, in the phase of skeletal growth, which usually happens at the time of uh, accelerated skeletal growth around five years of age and then nine and then about 13 years of age, uh, the bones usually become uh, weak because the bone lo loss dominates in remodeling phases of the bone. So during those phases when the bone is not being mineralized enough, uh, it, it becomes weak. And bone, as you know, is a component of uh, two parts, proteins inside it and the mineral content. Uh, and the mineral content, when it becomes weak, the bone does not have enough tensile strength to withstand the, uh, the, the functions which are expected of the skeleton, which usually means weight bearing, which usually means propelling, walking, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, we, we know the skeleton, really human skeleton, is uh, made of long bones and, and the other long bones, which are the ribs. And if they're not strong enough, uh, they, become, uh, they, they can injure themselves and develop deformities. Vitamin D, we all know, has an important function in the bone health and the muscle health as well. The function of the muscles as well as the bone is dependent on vitamin D, particularly in mineralization of the bones where the osteoblasts blasts, uh, are more important. <coughs> muscles as well in the muscle protein and in the cellular metabolism. Again, and I, I just put it up for, the, for reminding myself and others uh, to, to look at the importance of it. The way people present to us in, in uh, fracture clinics and in orthopedic clinics is, is really, uh, is two things really. You either have deformities or you have fractures. More and more often we are now seeing people with persistent deformities, which may or may not be the cause of osteoarthritis, or people may develop osteoarthritis, as all of us or most of us would do with the advancing age. Those deformities, they could be either fixed deformities, which all of the deformities turn into if not treated appropriately, or there may be what we call progressive deformities, which would be either in the form of front and back direction, which we call antromedial, uh, or uh, rotational profile, or rotational deformities, which the legs are turned inwards or outwards, and we'll discuss them a little bit later. And some people, uh, because of these deformities, or some without the deformities, uh, they, their height would be limited. Uh, and that is also something where the orthopedics can uh, be, be, be helpful. The fractures, again, we talked a little bit about earlier. Uh, they could be stress fractures, which are usually fractures which happen due to overloading. Or they could be the insufficiency fractures, which basically means that the bone mineral content is so low that even the physiological loading, which means maybe just standing, is enough to break the bone. Uh, and then you can have the persistent deformities, and which are the, the residue from the fractures uh, and, and uh, other injuries. Uh, and the progressive deformities, uh, and the degenerative joint disease, which I spend a little bit of time on uh, later on. So just one slide, really, that bone has one important function to perform in all of us, and that is to encourage us to walk effectively. Now, gait in orthopedics, we divide it into two phases. One is a stance phase, one is a swing phase. Stance phase being when the foot is on the ground, swing phase when the foot is in the air. To have normal gait pattern, we all have to have stability in the stance phase, which means that when I'm standing, I'm stable. Uh, and we have to have ground clearance so that when I walk, my foot clears the ground. And it should be pre-positioning, and it should be able to land on the heel. If none of that happens, we cannot have the normal gait. <coughs> uh, and th that is one of the problems with deformities and fractures. So when you have abnormal gait pattern, those deformities will become worse. 
and they are more prone to bone injury because there's no stability. Uh, and these are the two other things which we, which we need to be aware of in the, in the human skeleton. So if there's no stability and there's no, there's no symmetry, then the injuries are more common and deformities happen more often. So in my practice and most of orthopedic clinics, when you go and see them, although we might sound as outlandish at the time, but we are aiming to recreate the stability and we are crea creating the symmetry in the skeleton. And we hope by doing that, we will prevent the problems in the future. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on the fractures to start with because I think they're they the ones which cause most of the stress amongst the families and the patients. Although from an orthopedic point of view, they are relatively easy to manage because in patients with XLH and other metabolic disorders, healing of fractures is not that big an issue. All the fractures will heal if they are put in, in, a, in a good position. Uh, the, the challenge for us really is to make them heal in as good a position, as anatomical a position as possible so, so that we do not have complications later on in the form of deformities and recurrent fractures, really. So I found this uh, interesting paper. When you look at it, fractures actually are less common as compared to the normal population because people with XLH do not participate usually intuitively into the activities which predispose them to the fractures. But when these fractures happen, they are more difficult to manage. Bone pain, on the other hand, is probably one of the commonest uh, presentations after dental abscesses. And may I put it to you that a lot of this bone pain is actually coming from anthesopathies and structural pain, which may be micro fractures or maybe fractures which have not really happened but may happen in future. So in, in my opinion, a lot of these bone pain patients may have ensuing fractures later on, may have problems with it. The other issue with the fractures is that a lot of these are atypical. So the diagnosis may be delayed or even if it is diagnosed, a lot of the times we're scratching our head to say what to do with it. And, and we got a few examples to look at later on. This is one of the patients uh, who had a skeletal survey. And obviously we can see that there is a fracture in the, in the femur, but also there's deformities in the upper limbs. And it may well be that there has been fractures which have healed and there's deformities in the tibia as well. And that may well be that there has been injuries in the past which have been overlooked. This is not an uncommon way when these patients present with the fractures, when they have usually what we call a unicortical injury, where there's only one side of the bone which is broken, but nevertheless, if it's <coughs> left alone, it will go on to develop a, 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 a proper fracture, a complete fracture. The same one, you're starting to see signs of healing on the inside, but the gap on the outside is starting to increase. So in these patients, somebody, some, sometimes patients have to undergo bone scans and sometimes even bone biopsies before we can diagnose. And a lot of the time, these patients have not been diagnosed with XLH, and, and, and that is sometimes a presenting feature, although fortunately not as common as it used to be. Uh, and when these fractures do happen, with the deformity, sometimes we try and aim to correct the deformity at the same time when we're fixing the fracture. Therefore, the fixation is quite complex uh, and, and requires much more input from more specialized units uh, than your standard district general hospitals. Um, uh, obviously, once you've done that, the femoral deformity, or sorry, tibial deformity becomes more obvious, and that might need to be addressed as well. Just one slide, really, a couple of slides really on joint degeneration. Uh, some of the patients who are referred to me for osteoarthritis in patients with metabolic disorders do not usually have osteoarthritis. And like in this case, there are two stress fractures in the pubis rather than osteoarthritis, which was causing the pain. Patient was sent for total hip replacement and obviously did not require that and usually got better quite quickly. When we do come to uh, joint replacement, uh, it, it is a bit of a challenge <clears throat> because the patients would have had previous surgery, and even if they have not had previous surgery, they would have deformities, uh, and putting in a, a prosthesis is challenging. So we, we tend to use what we call 3D printed uh, hip replacements, which are designed for the particular patient, and we then know if they're gonna realign the leg or not. Like in this case, we have to draw all sorts of uh, muscle action forces to see if the hip would be uh, properly stable or not. Uh, and, and then the outcome usually is pretty good. I was gonna move on to deformities next. If you have any questions about fractures, shall I take them now? Or shall yes, we absolutely, no. Yeah. Are there any burning questions about fractures? Yeah. No? On the fractures after they've been treated? Uh, or well, it would be advisable not to, because if you do, you'll make them worse. Right. 
Yeah. So once they've been treated, we would encourage you to rate bear. Uh, so most of the time, we would be using what we call load bearing devices, which are the nails. Yeah. Uh, and we encourage you to rate bear. Because if you don't, then you, your healing is delayed. But if you have a stress fracture on one side and undergoing medical treatment, can you still walk around? Uh, with support, not fully weight bearing. Okay. You know, not, not fully weight bearing. Okay. Yeah. Is that what the question was? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Does um, body weight have a big impact <coughs> on this? Yeah. Does you... the weight, your personal weight, have an impact? Because I, I am one of two other siblings as well who have this, all girls. And my sister, who's seven years younger, has always suffered much more, but she's a lot heavier. And I wondered if that had an impact, because I have two children, so I'd like to understand. I try to keep my daughter's weight, you know, a, a very average, you know, which is... But I've got a son now who seems to be quite a big eater, and I'd like to understand if I should be trying to ensure that he keeps a very... You know, not a low weight, but a healthy average weight. Yeah. Well, I was going to talk about that in deformities, but it's a good point, because when you... The bones actually work like fulcrums. So if there's a momentum, which is a, like a seesaw, if you're sitting too close to the seesaw, you're putting less force through it. But if you're sitting away from it, uh, you're putting, you have to put more force through it, which means that if you have extra body mass, uh, obesity, then the incidence of fracture would increase. Okay. Uh, just by mechanical principles. So is it, it, it's is it of a big benefit to, as a child in particular when they're growing and the bones are soft to try and ensure that they're a healthy way? Correct. I would say yes. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, can I ask, most of the, I assume most of the fractures are... I assume most of the fractures are lower limb. Um, can you get them other places? Yes, you can. So I've, I've shown you two examples at least. One where the pelvis has fractured. Uh, and that is not an unusual place. And the other is the uh, humerus, which is the upper upper arm. Yeah, yeah, you can have that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much. So, so coming to deformities, uh, I, I think one of the uh, audience mentioned about it before. Uh, as an orthopedic surgeon, we see a lot of children with deformities. So, so we call some deformities as physiological deformities and some as pathological deformities. And by physiological deformities, I mean is that if you follow uh, a children's knee alignment, they go through a phase when they start with very bendy legs. So they're almost children, they're almost, you know, quite, quite bendy. I've seen one recently where <clears> you <throat> almost have to think, is it really physiological? So by definition, if the deformity does not correct by the time they are about two to three years of age, we would call it pathological. So most of the physiological deformities, as you can see here, by the time they're approaching five years of age, it's almost fully corrected. But if it doesn't correct by about three or not, it doesn't show signs of correction by the time they're two or three years of age, then that deformity should be considered pathological and should be investigated. Uh, and that would be in the standard orthopedic textbooks. The other thing is that the, the maximum volgus, which is the knees going outward, which is what we call physiological volgus, which we most of us have, is about 10 degrees, by about, and that is reached by three to four years of age. And if they're more volgus than that, which means the knee is really bending outwards, what somebody called a K-shaped deformity, uh, then that must be investigated. At maturity, uh, we think it's about six degrees, give and take. So it's very, very, very minimal. So any deformity after three to four years of age should be investigated and treated. But before that, I'm afraid simple orthopedic surgeons, we can't tell the difference between a metabolic disorder or just a physiological deformity. Uh, and when I'm talking about deformities, what I'm really talking about is the mechanics of gait cycle. So uh, the body weight going through the center of the hip should be going through the center of the knee and should be going through the center of the ankle. If it is not, it's creating the abnormal moments around the uh, centers of rotation or centers of motion in the hip, in the knee, and in the ankle, and that can then lead to not only deformity formation, but also extra forces going through the skeleton and possibly causing fractures as well. So this patient, what we call genu varus, really, is the bow leg. You can see the center of hip joint. If I go through the center of the ankle, it's literally about 10 centimeters away from the center of the knee, which means there's extra forces going through the femur, going through the tibia, going through these four, uh, the growth plates uh, around the knee joint, uh, and, and possibly contributing to the deformity formation, and also contributing to the possible <coughs> fractures if that person was exposed to abnormal loads. 
This, on the other hand, is the opposite, which is the genu valgus, which means the K-shaped deformity. The knee is going outwards. And again, there's a lot of forces going through that. And coming back to the question asked before, if there was extra body weight, for example, that extra body weight is multiplied by about three times uh, with these moment arms. Uh, and that would be contributing to a potential injury uh, or a deformity. Coming to the deformities, we now see less and less of them due to uh, a very useful work by, uh, by my medical colleagues uh, who are treating these patients much more effectively, and these deformities are treated with a medical treatment, and the, and the severity of those deformities is less, and the number of people coming to us with deformities is less as well. Uh, it's not the medical treatment, orthotic treatment, uh, and better education like, a, like a, a conference like this one. Nevertheless, when they come to us, they're usually the deformities which are not responding to this medical treatment, so they're non-responsive deformities. Uh, they have been there before the treatment was started, so they're residual deformities, and some of them are persistent. They have been treated once before, uh, and working in Stanmore, uh, that is certainly one of the issues where we have secondary deformities treated by somebody else, and a new deformity has developed, or the deformity has not been corrected. Uh, and, and that's where we come in. A majority of the treatment that we offer is what we call guided growth, rather than doing the <coughs> osteotomies which Sue had uh, and some of you others might have had. Uh, we can now treat the, uh, use the growth plate, a growing potential of the bone, to correct the deformity in the same way as some of you would be guiding your trees to grow in a particular dire direction. So this bonsai has been uh, changed into different shape by, by guiding the growth of that tree. As it happens, the logo for orthopedic surgery universally is a tree of Andre, which is usually uh, an olive tree which has been uh, supported. So orthopedic surgeons for centuries have been uh, good at gardening. Uh, we, we tend to use uh, eight plates, which was mentioned by Nick earlier on, and it's called eight plates just because it looks like eight. Uh, again, we are not very clever in orthopedics, we just keep it simple. So what we tend to do is, if we use this uh, knee as an example, so this knee is bent inwards, a uh, uh, bow legged. So we put the plate on the outside, which means the growth here has now stopped. And gradually, the center of rotation is moving because the growth on the inside is continuing. And it's a very simple, straightforward procedure. Small incision, doesn't got, cause too much pain, no plasters. Uh, and uh, even if there's infection, it's not usually that much of an issue. It usually responds very well to treatment. Uh, and, and most of the patients are very happy. And the success rate is about 90 plus percent. And that's what we call epiphysiodesis. So which basically means that you, epiphysis being, being the growth plate, we've stopped the growth of the growth plate. Uh, and the other benefit, added benefit, is if you do it in a very young child who still has got some growth left, you can take the uh, eight plate out and they start growing normally as they would have done. The caveat being that sometimes you will form the deformity again. But then because it's a simpler procedure, you can do it, do the procedure or repeat the procedure again. So this is what, I, uh, what we call reversible epiphysiodesis. So once we take the plate out, the growth starts happening again. And we do it in younger people who have a, a longer period of growth left. Or a permanent epiphysiodesis, which we do in people who would have been approaching the skeletal maturity. And we do not worry too much about causing uh, an, another deformity. Uh, so the example we saw earlier, so you got this uh, valgus deformity, so we put the growth plate on the concaves, uh, convex side of the deformity, and obviously the outside uh, bone continues to grow, and you got a, a almost near normal uh, uh, mechanical axis. The other example we looked at earlier, so you got a varus deformity here, so we put the growth uh, epiphysitis on the tibia on the opposite side, and although we haven't got a complete correction, uh, it's approaching that state. If, on the other hand, the child is approached or approaching skeletal maturity, or you want to reduce the height of one particular bone, we can do what we call permanent epiphysiodesis, where the growth plate is completely uh, damaged, destroyed, and there won't be any further growth in that particular part of the uh, uh, bone. Sometimes we would have people who not only have a <coughs> deformity, but there's a we, we need to lengthen the bone as well. And, and this is where the frames come into uh, play. So this is a Taylor spatial frame. Uh, and as you can see, you've got deformities in the knee as well as in the ankle. So in this case, we've done two osteotomies, really, one in the tibia, uh, proximal tibia, uh, higher up in the tibia, and one lower down. And we not only corrected the deformity, but we lengthened the patient as well. Some of you probably have been exposed to this sort of treatment. 
It's much more involved, much more technical, uh, high risk of complications, uh, and the frame kind of stays on for a few months uh, in, in some cases. The other forms of deformity correction uh, is a precise nail, uh, which has got a motor inside the nail, and we can use it to lengthen and correct the deformity, uh, or a Lizarov frame, uh, which is the same really as a Taylor spatial frame. It's just a different principle and, and how it works. I thought we'll uh, spend a little bit of time, because that's the bit which uh, most patients dread the most about, or worry the most about, the complications of all these treatments. Now, infection was mentioned by Sue earlier on. You'll be glad to hear that these days the risk of infection is less than 1 in 400 in most hospitals. So we, we're good at uh, antisepsis. We, we, we're good at uh, cleaning the instruments, looking after the infection if it happens. So the risk of infection is extremely low. A, a majority of the UK hospital is less than 1 in 400, which is 0.25%. The biggest worry in my practice, in my pediatric practice really, is undercorrection and overcorrection. So you either correct it too much, and you create a deformity, or you don't correct enough, and the deformity is still there. So from the, from the patient's point of view, either one of those situations are not acceptable, because you've gone through all this treatment, uh, and, uh, and the problem still persists. Fortunately, with the 8-plate and guided growth treatment, uh, the chances of that are less. In the same way with the, uh, with the Taylor spatial frame, the chances of that are less, because you have periods of time in the treatment when you can modulate your treatment, you can modify it, and if it is over-treating, you can control it uh, or under-treating, and you can accelerate it. Another uh, problem really is the uh, implant failure. So sometimes you might have come across that the plate or the screws break. Uh, the chance of that are getting less and less as metallurgy improves. Uh, so we think most of our implants are now strong enough to, to last and take care of any body weight, any body posture, and any deformity correction. So implant failure, although still possible, is less likely to happen as it used to before. Another issue really is a recurrence of deformity or refractures. So if, if there was a fracture presentation, you fix that fracture and the fracture happens again. Uh, in children, we, for the same reason, we're using the, what we call lengthening nails, so they grow with the person, so the, even if the fracture happens, it's already been treated. Uh, but recurrence of deformity is something which should be less often now than, again, what it used to be. Again, because we understand the mechanics better and, and uh, we plan it much better uh, with the computer-aided technologies. Some patients, and I had one recently where the skin healing was an issue, uh, and that can be probably because of uh, other modalities of treatment. Uh, atrophy of muscles and bones uh, is not uncommon. So uh, the rehabilitation is as important as the orthopedic treatment, uh, and you shouldn't really uh, ignore that. But by that, I mean physiotherapy and orthotic treatment. So to conclude, uh, fractures are less common, but difficult to diagnose <coughs> and manage. So you're going to have to put up with us, I'm afraid. So it's going to be a joint combined battle. Deformities, two types really, evolving or fixed, and both can be treated quite efficiently. And be aware that there'll be recurrent issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dyer. That was excellent. And uh, you've covered all the important areas which are relevant to XLH uh, from the surgical point of view. Are there any questions for Mr. Khan? <laughs> children like age four or five, that kind of age at school, are there like activities specifically that you might say avoid completely or? Is it before fracture or after the fracture no, has been treated? to avoid them. To avoid the fractures. If the fracture hasn't happened, uh, then I wouldn't avoid any activities because right. you need to really test it. If the bones may be good enough, the treatment you're getting with vitamin D and uh, uh, phosphate, it may be so good that the child could possibly have a normal activities of daily living, normal uh, activities and no, no restriction. If they have had a fracture, then you need to modify them mm. to avoid the injuries which might have caused those fractures. So most of the time, I would say contact sports is probably not the best sport for somebody who has had an insufficiency fracture. By contact sports, I mean rugby, football, and this sort of thing. Yeah. Right. We see an orthopedic surgeon in, in the UAE, and he's advised that my daughter does not do jumping, bouncing, 
trampolining, that kind of thing, which she loves to do. <laughs> so. I don't think I've ever stopped anybody doing that. I don't no, know. I think, I think <clears throat> the uh, loading of the bonds is quite important because yeah. it actually helps to make bonds bigger and stronger. And as long as the rickets is healed, um, then I don't think there should be any, uh, any, any reason for not uh, taking part in most physical activities. Would you agree, um, um, Nick and Raja? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. There's a question, two questions. Um, sorry, I think this lady yeah. was... Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was just going to ask as well. Um, you talked about internal nails. Um, I was of the era before the external, so I have internal nails about 25 years old. Should they, is your recommendation that they would be removed at some point or they would stay there if they cause no issues for the person? Well, the implants are designed to stay forever. They're not designed to be removed. So when we take them out, they, they, we, and there's enough evidence about that, there's a higher complication rate. If, on the other hand, they're causing a problem, or there is they're a not. risk that they might disappear in the bone at a later stage, then we advise them to be taken out. Okay. Uh, so it, it, it really horses for courses. So I, I think you'll have to listen to your, your orthopedic surgeon. And if they feel they don't have to be I'm taken... Really more, it's 25 years ago. Well, I, I wouldn't worry. They, I don't have any problems. I wouldn't so worry about them. Just <coughs> yeah, like to stay in forever. Yeah, leave them I alone. Survive. Yeah, Thank you'll you. be fine. <laughs> Sue, hi. Hi. Can I just ask, um, the epiphysiodesis? Epiphysiodesis. Yeah, yeah, those. When would you do them in a child? I mean, mm. my grandson's obviously very badly affected, and I don't think it's ever been um, offered to him, so... I would normally do after the first growth spurt, usually after about six or seven years of age. And that's usually the time when they start, you start seeing the deformities getting worse. Uh, you can't really, it doesn't, in my hands anyway, it doesn't re usually work after 12, 11 years of age, especially in girls. If they're post menarche if they started having periods, epiphysitis doesn't do much correction. Mm -hmm. So I think you have a window of opportunity between, let's say, six, seven years of age till about 10, 11 years of age. Uh, so is I that quite, something quite new? I don't know. Uh, it's not that no, new. No, it's not no. It, it has been thought about, but I think because he's in the trial, um, it would it's be inappropriate to intervene with that because it will affect the outcome of the trial. Okay. Okay. I think there's a question there. So. Same question. Same question. Right. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Pond? Oh, there's. Um, <coughs> sorry, Oliver at the back. <laughs> Um, I don't mind you shouting. <laughs> I get shouted at all the time. <laughs> um, sorry, it was just to what you said earlier. Um, I'm not really sure if this should be directed to you, but why do non-weight-bearing bones like the upper limbs show signs of deformity? From my point of view, it, just, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. In my opinion, and I think a lot of people would agree with that, in some people, upper limb bones become weight-bearing bones. Because of the lower limb weakness, or uh, for other reasons, you're using upper, upper limb bones to lift yourself off. Oh. Uh, or if somebody is using crutches, then they become the weight bearing bones. And they can have a deformity, micro fractures, uh, and that sort of thing. Could I squeeze in another question? Of course. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, could you explain a little bit about the, um, the signature gait that we have and the, the sort of the formation of the hips? that we all see? Yeah. A patient with XLH, uh, because of majority of them would have a various deformity. They have what we call a propulsion thrust, which means they, they don't really land on the heel. They land on what we call a second rocker. The foot is flat, yeah. and they do not have the push-off. So when <coughs> people with, with a normal alignment of the legs, when they walk, they land on the heel, and as they go forward, the body weight is propulsing them, and we, we don't use much energy when we're walking. But in people who have deformity, they're landing on the flat foot, and they have to lift the foot up and abduct the hips to get the ground clearance. I'm sorry, I'm getting a bit more technical here. Yeah. But the, the bottom line really is they're hitching the hip every, with every step. Uh, and that's why they're forcing the hip into more uh, inward position, into a various alignment. And we call it a propulsion thrust, really. And that, that, that's probably one of the reasons why they walk the way they, the way they do. Okay. Sorry. Yep. Hi, yeah. Um, my partner suffers from micro fractures uh, about two years ago, but these weren't picked up in a normal x ray. It had to be scanned. She had to have a scan, and obviously, you go to 
an A&E because you think you've hurt your ankle or whatever and it's not picked up, so you're sent away with a sprain. Yeah. This happens quite often. Unfortunately, it does. Uh, and uh, Zulf would agree with me that a lot of our patients would present late for that same reason. Uh, obviously, if you know your condition, uh, then you can insist that you go for a bone scan. That, that's the only reason I showed that slide with a bone scan, because bone scan is very, very sensitive to these fractures, but not as specific as we want it to be. And sometimes we have to do an MR scan or CT scan or something else to pick it up. Uh, we've all been guilty of missing these fractures. Uh, I raised my hand, but the, the thing is, uh, x-rays are the only cheaply and most commonly available in modality we have. And if you don't see a fracture on the x-ray, rather than saying there's no fracture, I would normally say I can't see a fracture. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's where we stand, I'm afraid. Any more questions? Yeah, please. Yes. I got a problems with my feet, and my GP will just give me injections every few years. Now, I've never broke a bone. I know I'm overweight, and I've got other health issues. But a few years ago, I fell and tore the cartilage in my knee and didn't walk very well. And then when I started walking my feet, and they said, oh, you're flat-footed, we'll give you these injections. Should I have been saying to the hospital, I'm having problems with my feet? Yeah. Uh, it depends on what problem it is. It, it may well be that you have what we call plantar fasciitis. Uh, and that's very, very common. Uh, people who especially who are flat-footed, uh, and all that means is inflammation in the fascia on the sole of your foot, and that's probably not related to XLH or any of the metabolic disorder. <coughs> Maybe that's what they're treating. Yeah. Uh, but if it is uh, anthesopathy or is it something else, then it needs to be investigated uh, and you may need different treatment. I'm not, it's impossible for me to comment. Yeah. It's just the, the, all the GPs said, I'll give you these injections, you'll be fine. It was never looked at, so... Yeah. <laughs> Oh, there is a question there, sorry. I just want to know, I mean, my son had bone <coughs> leg, leg and it was corrected, but after correction, the leg walked like this now. Is that anything can be done on that? So he's gone the other way around, is that what you said? No, you, yeah, they walk, they are like, you know, walk this way. But is there anything, because the doctors say, because there's so many bones there, they cannot correct anything. Is there anything can be done on that? Yeah, well, that's not true, that if it's been done once, it can't be done again. So if there is a deformity, it can be corrected again. Uh, from what you're describing, it seems to me that the, your son is intoing, uh, and that could be coming either from the hip bones or coming from the shin bones. Uh, and I don't know what the deformity was before and what have they corrected before, but the intoing can be corrected if need be. A lot of the time, children grow out of intoing as well. The incorrect on the bottom, because it's more to do with the heel, the way right. he walks. The legs are straight now, uh -huh. but he's only the walking on a hill, so the leg, you know, he walk this way. They, they oh, is he, he might have foot deformity, so you need to see an orthopedic surgeon to see if there's a foot problem, because his foot may be going into too much hyperpronation, so to say. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> so. Hi, uh, I just wanted to ask you, you spoke about the pressure that bowed legs can put on parts of the bone. Is it the same for the other condition, the K-type? Does yeah. that have a it's serious... Exactly the same. So uh, when I talk about pressure, I'm talking about what we call moment arms, which is a technical term, which basically point from center of rotation to point where the load is going. And if you have the deformity in bow legs or the other way around K-legs, uh, there's more pressure going on the inside or the outside of the bone, and you can have the deformity uh, relevant to the two. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I was just going to say, orthopedics is becoming much more specialised. You just get upper limb orthopedic surgeons and lower limb and hip and knee. They're all different now. It just seems you pass from pillar to post sometimes. You've got hip problem, no, and then you've got, you're seeing one orthopedic surgeon, and then you've got a foot problem. Well, no, I can't deal with it. You've got to go to another one. I mean... Is that something we've just got to look forward to, or are there people that can deal with the whole thing for people with XLH? Well, ch ch you'll be glad to hear children's orthopedic surgeons are not that specialised yet. <laughs> yeah. So most children's orthopedic surgeons will look at you holistically, and they wouldn't, I hope, wouldn't be passing the, uh, you know, passing the buttons. <coughs> In adult orthopedics, because it is so specialised now, none of us can be expert of everything. So uh, although, so my practice is young adult hip, so I, I would actually talk to somebody who I think knows more about, let's say, upper limbs than I do, and, and would send you there. But usually lower limbs 
I would deal with all of them, hips, knees, and feet. But upper limbs and spine, I can't, uh, because none of us have the time and the resources to do all of it. Is there anything evolving to help with the ankles and feet? You know, as we're there, getting older, there is a lot of things to evolving going. in ankles and feet, but it depends on the problem, obviously. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm conscious of the fact that we have time. Okay, just one more question, sorry. Last yeah, sure. question. I just wanted to, to ask one thing. My daughter also has like ankle valgus. Mm -hmm. Is that softer? The ankle valgus, uh, prob uh, depend I mean, it's usually not ankle valgus. It's probably the foot valgus, which is the joint below the ankle. Uh, if it is uh, too excessive, again, it can be corrected. And if it needs correcting, it can be corrected. More often than not, it uh, falls into the physiological remit. So if, for example, you look at everybody's feet in this room, one in 10 people would have very vulgus or hyperponated feet. And hence you got these uh, runners who got these specialist hyperponating shoes for runners because it's so common. Uh, but if it is pathological and causing problem, then yeah, it can be corrected. Although I must warn you, the correction success rate is about 80%, which to me is not good enough. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> oh. Yeah. Right, thank you. One more question. That's, that will be the final question, thank you. Um, with my ankles, um, I've had extra bone growth in both of them. Um, uh, so it's bone spur in both, um, which has been shaved down twice. It's now recurred again, um, but the <coughs> surgeon is reluctant to do another surgery. But in my mind, it gives me two, a good two years before it comes back. And is it, it on the back of your heel? It's in the front. It's in the front of my ankle. Yeah. The problem with the so antezo it locks my feet. Antezopathy and osteophytes is that uh, they are known to recur. Uh, I suspect your surgeon is worried that he might be weakening your muscles by repeatedly, op repeatedly operating on them. Uh, but uh, I suppose if you get a couple of years out of it, and it, it's between you and your surgeon, really. But you must remember that osteophytes and antezo antezophytes they do recur. Mm -hmm. It's just the nature of the beast. Is the final decision with me or the surgeon? A combined decision, I'm afraid. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I think we must thank you again and thank have you. a safe journey back to thank London. You. Thanks, and thank you very much once again for <clears throat> uh, coming to speak to us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.